<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. This is, uh, we're going to call this meeting to order of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District uh, meeting to order uh, at uh, on February 24th, 2022 at 9.03 a.m. If the clerk could please call the roll to establish the quorum. Director Aquino? Here. Director Daniels? Here. Director Desmond? Director Frost? Here. Director Guetta? Here. Director Harris? Director Kennedy? Here. Director Lalowi? Director Natoli? Director Papineau? Here. Director Serna? Director Singh Allen? Here. Director Terry? Director Vang? Here. We have quorum, and I have Director Harris coming into the meeting right now as well. Perfect. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, if uh, folks could please, well, before we get started, I'd, I always like to remind folks that you can, uh, this is the Air Quality Management District for Sac Metro area, and you could go to airquality.org or sparetheair.com to check out our uh, air quality management level. And today we are at uh, 68 in the AQI for 2.5 p.m., which is moderate. Uh, yesterday was good. We we're at 38. But today's moderate and the forecast looks moderate. So with that, if folks don't mind standing and joining me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. If the clerk wouldn't mind, please reading the announcement. In compliance with directives of the State and Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the physical location of this meeting is closed to the public, consistent with state or local officials' recommendations to promote social distancing and Assembly Bill 361. Members of the public are encouraged to participate in the meeting by observing the meeting in real time at metro14live.saccounty.gov, Zoom video conference, conference line, and by submitting written comments electronically by email at boardclerk at airquality.org. Comments submitted in person will be delivered to the board of directors by staff. Public comments regarding matters under the jurisdiction of the board of directors will be acknowledged by the chairperson and accepted until the adjournment of the meeting, distributed to the board of directors and included in the record. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed captioned and will be webcast at metro14live.saccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated on Saturday, February 26, 2022 at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Very good. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank um, you. And uh, if, uh, Madam Clerk, if we go to our next item on the agenda here. The first item on the agenda is the Air Pollution Control Officer Report, and I have Alberto on the line to give his presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Selena. Can you uh, load up the uh, slides, please? Okay. Perfect. Good morning, board. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, next slide, please. I have a very brief uh, APCO report. Um, uh, pretty soon you're gonna hear from our legislative advocate and uh, they're gonna share with you some of the uh, state level activities when it comes to, um, when it comes to legislation that, that we are tracking that we're involved in. So I thought I'd do the same uh, at the federal level um, just to kind of give you a sense of some of the things that, um, that we are tracking and, and getting involved in. Um, and the first one is, um, as I'm sure you're, you're, you're hearing, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, good activity uh, coming out of the federal government in terms of um, investments for uh, uh, clean air and, and, and greenhouse gas emission reductions and, and that sort of thing. Um, one of the uh, bills that we recently supported, uh, along with uh, 74 other organizations, 
is this um, House bill um, still doesn't have a number, but it's essentially um, dubbed the electric vehicles for all, EVs for all. Uh, it was introduced by Congresswoman uh, Barragan. She represents uh, the Torrance area down in Southern California. And, and basically is gonna establish a grant program specifically to fund car sharing at public housing uh, projects uh, throughout the, the US. Um, why are we tracking and why are we supporting uh, this effort? Uh, simply because uh, we've got one of those programs and is one of our most um, visible and successful uh, programs in the region, our community car share. Uh, we've recently reported to you that we've had, we have about a dozen different communities within our district that have uh, these car sharing programs. Uh, clearly we wanna do more and uh, we're excited to see this level of activity at the federal level because clearly um, we've shown that we know how to do this and hopefully it will translate into uh, more funding and support for this type of program uh, in the region throughout the state and the country. So that's, that's one of, the, one of the, the recent activities that we were tracking and for your information in your board packet, uh, I included a copy of, of the actual letter uh, in case you're curious. Uh, next slide, please. And then the last thing is uh, we're also tracking uh, very closely what is coming out of our uh, sister agency, the, the Environmental Protection Agency. You may recall that I've shared with you in the past that we are a member of the National Association of Cleaner Agencies. So we join um, 150 other uh, state and local agencies throughout the country. Uh, and our principal job is essentially to speak on behalf of clean air for, for our agencies. Um, Thankfully, EPA is very busy and they're working on a lot of very good um, policies and strategies. Uh, so we're tracking a number of them. Uh, the first one that I wanna to mention to you is, is methane emission controls. Uh, methane, as you know, is a very important greenhouse gas and the Biden administration is, is, is hinted that they are going to be putting out uh, new methane rules for controlling that, that uh, greenhouse gas. Um, we're also tracking and supporting the development of new uh, emission standards for air aircraft engines. Uh, that's something that hasn't been done uh, in any time recently. And, and obviously as other sources get cleaned up, uh, aircraft engines and, and airports in general are going to be a rising uh, uh, concern from a, from a pollution standpoint. Um, heavy duty trucks, uh, you've heard us say that th those are some of the biggest sources of air pollution. Uh, that we are interested in, uh, but we are preempted from doing anything uh, about them. So it's really the feds and the, uh, and the state that hold the key to solving the uh, heavy duty truck pollution problem. Uh, the federal government is working on the next set of standards. Um, so um, we are tracking and supporting that. Uh, you're gonna hear in the news for sure, um, the um, retaking of the emission standards, uh, greenhouse gas emission standards, for power plants. And obviously this is very important because this is really gonna set the power sector on track to carbon neutrality uh, in the future. Um, so we're tracking that important uh, rule as well. And there's a couple others, um, toxics, mercury emissions from, from uh, power sources as well. And then um, more stringent national ambient air quality standards for particulate matter that the agency is currently working on. We're expecting a decision by this summer to see if the US will have more stringent PM standards. And if, if EPA decides to say, yes, we need more protective standards, then um, next year we'll see what those standards are going to be. So again, I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the things that are happening at the, at the federal level that impact us. Um, and with this, uh, Mr. Chair, I conclude the APCR report. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Dr. Ayala, uh, first, uh, you know, one, uh, you know, I appreciate that great work that Congressman Barragan, I got to know her when she was council member Barragan in, uh, in the South Bay. Uh, and uh, I think uh, her, her work, just like uh, the advocacy that uh, our board member Jeff Harris here has done on, on EVs and on the air, uh, the future air electric EVs is something inspiring for us to be engaged in. I do think that uh, that's a huge manufacturing area for us. And I see uh, uh, Board Member Harris has got his hand, hand punched up here. Not surprising on this issue. Yeah, thank you, Chair. A, a question for Dr. Ayala. 
there was a national news story yesterday that many power plants are emitting a lot more methane than has been recorded. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that subject. Well, the thought is, um, you know, we all had a, a rude awakening of sorts when we realized that the methane system infrastructure in general, I mean, the methane that, that comes out of uh, power plants and, and the methane that gets distributed across uh, uh, our estate and other places, the system is very leaky. And the inventories that we had in the past were completely undercounted. So the more we look at it and the better tools we deploy to track the emissions, uh, the more we realize that there's a lot more in the air than we initially accounted. And, and as I said, it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. And that's the reason why the uh, federal action to control it is very welcome news. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree because, of course, methane is a much more dangerous greenhouse gas than CO2. Um, Chair, thanks for mentioning EV air. I appreciate that. And, you know, you all have heard me crow about electric airplanes several times. Well, tomorrow I'm happy to say I'm flying to Fresno to go fly these electric airplanes. And uh, my hope is to bring them to Sacramento region very soon, working with SMUD and Arlen Orchard and the Mobility Center. Uh, to work on charging infrastructure at three local airports. Uh, so, you know, mobility is going to change and it's going to move towards short hop air travel, I think in a big way with localized drones, vertical takeoff and landing drones, which will probably be commercially viable by 2025. So it'd be great to position our region to capture some of that business and hopefully manufacturing at the mobility center and just poise us to uh, get in front of uh, what I think will be a real revolution in travel. So thanks for letting me speak, Chair, that's it. Thank you, no, I appreciate that. Uh, I think also, you know, last thing to point on before we, we move on is capturing and looking at how we uh, transform methane at its uh, sources. I know we've had some discussions of that into hydrogen allows us to be able to, you know, avoid the, the leakiness in the pipes, but also if we build the infrastructure, we might be able to have another fuel that helps us with heavy duty use. But uh, with that, Dr. Yala. Yes, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to reply real quick to um, uh, Director Harris and the point that, that he made about um, EV uh, aircraft and commercial aviation. Um, it reminded me another action that EPA is currently working on is to look at the lead emissions from these small air, air, um, airports around the country. And the only reason I mentioned it to you all is because we have one of those airports, Executive Airport. And we know that the lead emissions that come from the leaded fuel that those aircraft engines, the small aircraft need, can be potentially a concern. So that's one of the things that EPA has already announced that they're going to be looking at. So I just wanted to make you aware because that may be something that, I, that we may bring back to you just so that you know uh, what is happening because clearly uh, the lead emissions from executive aircraft, uh, from an executive airport here in our region, are something that we hear often from our communities uh, in terms of concerns. So just just wanted to put that on the table for you all. Thanks. Yeah, if I can follow up just briefly, Chair. So the EPA is trying to remove lead from all general aviation aircraft fuel. The problems, of course, are distribution of, <clears throat> of an alternative fuel that would work in all piston engines. It's a very difficult problem, uh, but all the more reason to move towards electric in aircraft. Uh, it would solve two problems. The problem uh, that we you know, deal with is energy density and range, but there's been a lot of forward progress. So it's gonna be interesting to see how that all plays out, but the general aviation uh, fleet is still dependent upon 100 low lead, but we are making progress. Thank you. Eric, that's it. So thank you, Director Harris. Very good. If there are no other questions from the board for our air pollution control officer, uh, seeing no hands. I um, think Dr. Kennedy, Kennedy is raising his oh, hand. I see he's waving over there. There he goes. Yeah, Director Kennedy. Thank you. Sorry, Chair. I'm, I'm on the phone today, so I don't know how the raised hand thing works as well. Um, uh, on the executive airport issue, I just, uh, Dr. Ayala, I hope you will keep me in the loop, very close in the loop, as that is a county operated facility owned by the city, but county operated facility, and it is in the district that I represent. Um, and I have, I am convening a meeting 
in two or three weeks of multiple county departments to address that and see what is the potential is uh, and and what the obstacles are for moving forward with that type of thing. So if you could keep me informed and closely, that I would uh, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any other members of the board are wishing uh, questions for the air pollution control officer? If not, thank you everyone. Let's move on to the next item here. The next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Item number one, Assembly Bill 361 Compliance, Remote Meetings During Declared Emergency. Item number two, January 27th, 2022, Board of Director Meeting Minutes. Item number three, Contract Amendment with ARC Strategies, LLC. Great, thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any members from the public wishing to speak on this item? No, Chair. Let me bring this back to the board. Members of the board, any questions uh, from the board? And if not, I'll take a motion on the consent calendar. So moved. It's been moved by board member Vang. Second, Sing Allen. Been, been sec seconded by board member Sing Allen. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Director Aquino. Aye. Director Daniels. Aye. Director Desmond. Director Frost. Aye. Chair Guetta. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Kennedy. Aye. Director Lalowi. Aye. Director Natoli. Director Papineau. Aye. Director Serna. Director Singh Allen. Aye. Director Terry and Director Vang. Yes. This item passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Well, good thing that that one passed so that we can move on to the next one. <laughs> the next item is the discussion calendar. Item number four, 2022 legislative priorities by ARC strategies. And I believe Jaime is gonna give a brief introduction prior to the presentation. Good morning, board chair and members of the board. So our director has already touched a little bit on federal advocacy. And so now we're gonna share a little on the state side. The state of California continues to focus on climate change and the environment. So a legislative update on the governor's budget is important as part of the effort to keep the board informed of the district's legislative efforts on AB 661, Carl Moyer and AB 617. So our state advocates, Amy Brown and Kim Craig with our strategies will provide this briefing. Ms. Brown and Ms. Craig, welcome. Thank you. I think Amy's on. I am on. I'm right here. Oh, well, there you are. Well, now, now that the board approved your contract, I guess you can give the presentation. <laughs> there you go. Happy to. Um, so we've been asked to kind of uh, give a legislative and budget overview uh, for the board, as well as um, a lot of the activity that we are uh, presenting and talking with legislators on behalf of the Air District. Um, I'll let Kim start with slide number two, and then we're going to we're going to um, sort of toggle back and forth uh, for the 15 minutes that we have. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think at the top of the Air District uh, legislative priorities statewide are Car Moyer and the AB8 reauthorization. Those, you know, those important programs are set to expire in 2023. And so last year, there were a push by some to try and reauthorize those programs, look at some changes to those programs. Unfortunately, some of the, those efforts fell flat. I think there was concern about tax increases in a uh, coming into a calendar, coming into an election year. And so I think, you know, the administration also said, you know, we still have a little bit of time before those programs run out. And so there wasn't a lot of political will and desire to, to do that last year. However, this year we see a renewed push, not only from air districts interested in, but uh, legislators. And so we'll start to see some of those uh, proposals move through budget and through policy bills. Uh, we've had a deadline of February 18th, which was last Friday, to introduce new bills. And so you see several bills, what we would 
term spot bills right now, so don't have a lot of substantive information in them, but, but signals from members that they want to work on these programs and find some policy changes and look for reauthorization. So that's just starting up and we'll have a long discussion through the legislative process and the, and, and the budget into, into June 15th. Next. Yeah. So yeah, before you go on to the next slide too, what we do um, on behalf of the Air District is we flag every single bill that would remotely sort of have any sort of effect on the Air District and put that in a legislative matrix that is shared with um, board members. We're doing that now coming through all of the bills and making sure that that matrix um, reflects all of the uh, sort of priorities and what we're doing on behalf of the Air District. So you can go to the next slide, I'll take this one. So, you know, the Carl Moore program, we've really been working with the legislative delegation to see if we can, you know, propose some changes or solutions to the existing um, program. Carl Moore in particular, we call this scrap the scrap requirement. Scrapping the requirements essentially shuts down um, many potential participants. You know, the existing state criteria that requires replaced engines to be scrapped is important in traditional projects, but really what we're seeing now is this inequitable for new potential um, projects fo focused on um, vehicle electrification. And the requirement really reduces participation from, you know, small businesses, sole proprietors, um, community organizations, small fleet operators who do not readily possess a vehicle to scrap and it makes fleet expansion with zero emission um, technology difficult. So we've been working with um, Senators Pan and Dodd as well as um, Assembly Members McCarty and, and Cooley and Cooper to see if there um, is a way that we can make those changes. We're also looking at allowing for a broader suite of climate and pollution exposure reduction projects outside of the 617 communities. Um, you know, the state funded climate and pollution exposure uh, projects are allowed in only, you know, those 617 uh, selected communities. And there's a lot of what we can do outside of that program that could benefit some sort of similar projects. They could, you know, so we're looking, we're asking, you know, the legislative delegation to look at expanding, say, the urban canopy in um, marginalized uh, tree deficient communities. We're also looking at, you know, covered uh, bus stops. We're looking at, um, you know, charging stations, et cetera, that expand outside of the scope of 617 communities. So, like I said, you know, our team has been reaching out and sending letters and following up with the legislative delegation, but even outside of the um, legislative delegation that represents the Sacramento Air District um, geographical location, we're also um, working with assembly members, Christina Garcia and Eduardo Garcia, who are teaming up um, in, an, in a companion uh, number of bills to look at changes made to the existing 617 communities. And if you go to the next slide, I'll, we'll show you a little more of th those um, efforts. So, you know, there's been some policy concerns that have come out, especially on the Senate side, um, on the effectiveness of 617. And so what we're looking at right now and what um, both uh, Assembly Member Garcia's have told us is that, you know, AB 1749 and AB 2141 currently right now are spot bills, but they're going to be sort of the, the um, two companion bills that are gonna look at some of the policy concerns and address some of the um, issues that have come up as well as additional funding for uh, 617 projects. because. When you know 617 was going through, there was a lot of concern about the amount of money attributed to that program and how it was not going to be sufficient enough. So um, we've had some verbal discussions with both assembly members in looking at an expanded um, uh, funding 
uh, effort um, uh, on behalf of the two assembly members. So in that vein, as those um, bills start taking effect, we will continue to push flexibility efforts on behalf of the district, not only with the two assembly members, but also with um, you know the uh, delegation that we've mentioned before. So can you go to the next slide for me? Okay, so the other priority programs that are really being pushed not only by um, you know the Air District, but also uh, CAPCOA, who put a letter together um, to the governor and both leaders of the assembly and Senate, the three um, issues that are priority programs for CAPCOA are wildfire response and mitigation. Um, you know, in 2022-23, this budget cycle, they propose that the governor's January uh, budget proposes 2 million for each year for a continuance of this program, which is helping to meet the goal of treating the 1 million acres of um, vegetation annually beginning 2025 as identified by the US uh, Forest Service and the California MOU. The wildfire response and mitigation, it's really sort of coming off the heels of a bill that was passed in 2018 that created a program to expand prescribed burns. Um, so, you know, again, we're thinking that the 2 million is not enough. We're asking for uh, a consideration of more, um, but as the budget committee, the, the budget subcommittees take effect and start having hearings, these issues will come up and, um, you know, will be presented on behalf of, you know, the, um, the uh, air districts in California. The, um, the couple others that I wanted to mention as well, the agricultural uh, diesel replacement upgrades, uh, the, the replacement measures for emission reductions or other word, uh, or in other words, farmer, the farmer program provides funding through local air districts to reduce emissions from ag harvesting equipment, heavy duty trucks, et cetera. Um, they're, you know, they, again, very small amount that was received, um, actually a, a larger amount was received in the 2021-22 budget um, at, in the neighborhood of about 212, 213 million. This year it is proposed through the governor's budget that it's 150 million in proposed funding. So CAPCOA along with the district supports that. The last one I'll mention is the wood smoke reduction program. Um, for, you know, this, it, it was interesting when we started looking into this, approximately 217,000 uh, residents in California use wood heating as their primary source and an estimated additional 3.6 million um, residents that use uh, wood heating to supplement other sources of heat. There, last year in the 2021-22 budget, it included 5 million for that wood smoke reduction program. Unfortunately, this year's proposed budget doesn't include funding for this program. So we are hopeful that through our advocacy efforts that that program will have um, a funding mechanism through legislative uh, discussions on the budget. So next slide, and I'm gonna kick it back over to Kim. Thank you. So just to, a Amy referenced it a bit, but I wanted to get a little bit more granular specific for, for the Air District. You know, we've had some opportunities to educate and inform, you know, the regional members on the need for flexibility for funds in 617. Uh, Alberto and his team have done a lot of work in the community to identify projects, you know, additional emission reduction projects throughout the community that could be helpful. And so we've worked together to come up with an $11.4 million general fund ask. We can leverage those dollars with the existing 617 to do a broader suite of projects to really be outside the SERP and, and, and to benefit the entire community. And so, you know, through the through the local process that Jaime and them have worked on, the projects include urban greening and forestry, community bus stops, e-mobility hubs. And so what we've done with that proposal is we've sent letters to Dr. Pan, 
to Cooper, McCarty, Dodd, and Cooley, and we'll start to follow up on this specific request. The budget process for what's termed members requests will really start in earnest at the end of March, beginning of April. So we're, you know, out in front here educating those very important members about what the district needs specifically to be able to meet the community needs that and the work that's been done currently in the district. So we're working on that. And Amy and I have been going around to those members to find a, uh, a champion and continue to try and get some additional funds. We think it's a good year, especially with the large uh, budget surplus again, to identify some projects like this and be able to get a carve out for the district to, to meet these needs. Next slide. And then I think the final thing that we wanted to highlight was in 2019, Assemblymember McCarty really was concerned about all the wildfires and the wildfire smoke and some of the changing, you know, the misinterpretations or the inability and lack of coordination from entities about what to tell schools and should we shelter in place or is it just inside the classroom? What's safe for our kids and how do we do that? And so, uh, Alberto and his team worked with the with the uh, assembly member to come up with AB six six one to talk about you know what are what are important uh, wildfire mitigation measures and how do we notify the public and our schools and so uh, over the past two years it's been a little bit delayed because of COVID right but I think they're close to finishing their report back to the legislature and so you know on they've been able to coordinate with school districts, with the superintendents, with public health, and OEHA to come up with a process for, you know, if the AQI is X, these are the things that we should be doing in a whole collaborative approach. So everybody's on the same page and we have the most helpful standards in place to figure out what type of information to provide to the public when we have those big smoke days. So we are currently collaborating with Assembly Member McCarty on rolling out the finalization of that report and then um, and also trying to coordinate with him to present that report as required to the Air Resources Board later on in the year. So some really good work that you all have done to set a, an example for others to look at statewide about how to coordinate locally and to provide the best information for the public. So that is where we are at in our uh, priorities and work for the district this year. So we're happy to take uh, any questions that um, you all have. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brown and Ms. Craig. Uh, first, you know, let me thank you for your your uh, your advocacy and your support in this effort. And uh, you know, I'm a, I'm assuming that uh, when we looked at these projects, uh, maybe this is Director Ayala to you. The 11.4 million was not only the city of Sacramento, but we're talking about the um, the needs in the unincorporated county, uh, the other unincorporated cities like Elk Grove, Rancho, Folsom, um, you know, and and others. Uh, is, is that correct when we looked at where our, where our gaps are? Uh, yes, absolutely. To the extent that we get the flexibility that uh, Amy and, and uh, Kim talked about, uh, you may recall that we actually identified 10 different neighborhoods within our district um, that could use the help. So uh, if we get the flexibility, uh, we are certainly uh, open to, we want to deploy projects throughout the whole region. Uh, the way that we've been doing and working with the other districts for for many many years very good and then lastly i do want to just say you know i, I you know appreciate uh you know assembly member mccarty carrying ab661 but i do have to recognize the brainchild came out of uh, our former chairs uh steve hansen who did the the legwork and brought this forward to really make it happen and push it forward so uh, I, I wanted to uh, you know thank also the district staff who helped piece that together here I do see board member Aquino's hand raised here. Board member Aquino. Yeah, thank you. I just have more of a general question because since I uh, joined this board, I think maybe about a year and a half ago, this is the first legislative update that I can remember. Um, and so my question is probably more for Dr. Ayala or the chair. When, when you're talking about individual pieces of legislation and whether the Air District, you know, our board is going to support that, is it, is it up to staff? Do those individual pieces of legislation come to the board? Is there some sort of legislative um, platform that has already been adopted? And as long as the legislation you know, fits within that, it's, it's automatic. I, I just was wondering about the process, so I know. Yeah, thank you, uh, Board Member Aquino. We actually used to have, uh, when we were meeting in person, we had the, the team come and present in the room. The last couple of years have been a bit, a bit odd, but 
Uh, and we did have a plat we do have a platform that is a standard platform. But Dr. Yala, do you want to go through that uh, the that platform? Yeah, that um, that's a really good question, Director Aquino. And and to your point, uh, we try to bring our legislative advocate on a regular basis, but um, we do exercise discretion in terms of if it's not you know worthy of of, of noticing and, and discussing. Um, as you, as as they mentioned. We are very closely working with CAPCOA, the California Association of Air Pollution Control Officers. And they themselves have, have lobbyists uh, and legislative advocate resources that track all this legislation. So it's, it's very uncommon for us to pinpoint something that only pertains to us. Uh, it is very much a, going to be a statewide uh, process. So for that reason, um, this particular board has not instituted, to my, to my knowledge, a legislative subcommittee. Now, to your point, I would definitely welcome uh, greater engagement from you if you want to, you know, uh, dig deeper into some of these legislative priorities. Uh, 99.9% of the time, we are going to be weighing in on things that are good for air quality and are good for climate change. And I hope that, um, you know, given that, that you are on an air board, that you would support those actions as well. Yes, thank you. I, I wasn't questioning any specific piece of legislation that was, I, I was just wondering about the general process because I, I know sometimes um, time is of the essence and when you're trying to sign on to uh, support or oppose something, you know, you don't necessarily want to have to schedule a meeting and all that kind of stuff. And, and I know, at least for the city of Folsom, this is something we're trying to be more proactive about. And, and we have adopted a legislative platform so that when something comes up, the city manager and the mayor can just, you know, fire off a letter and, and be done with it. Yeah. No, and, and it's a really good point. And honestly, I want to acknowledge um, uh, your support of our legislative advocate because we just wouldn't have the resources to track, you know, the, the hundreds or thousands of bills that go through, right? And as they as they alluded to, they do a great job for us. Now, when they do flag something, uh, we go through it and exercise our discretion. And believe me, if there's anything that pertains to any one of you, uh, you're going to get a phone call from us. Uh, but luckily. Uh, that doesn't tend to happen too often because, again, these are general legislative strategies that are good for clean air, that are good for uh, pollution reduction. There are some controversial ones, no, no question, uh, but I think for the most part, um, you know, they're able to handle, be handled uh, in, in the context of the CAPCOA, the Statewide Association. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Brown and Ms. Craig, for your uh, your work. Uh, we hope you'll get us uh, some more flexibility. Obviously, some more funding is also uh, very well welcome. So, uh, a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. I'm well, glad to. Glad to. And, and feel free to pull when you need a board member on an issue. I think work with our air pollution control officer. Many of our board members have relationships with both uh, Assemblymember Cooley, uh, Cooper McCarty, Senator Pan, and Senator Dodd. So I think. Being able to you know, use our, our resources would be glad to be of help. And, and I certainly want to acknowledge and thank you, Chair, because you know you never say no to us when we want to drag you along and go meet with legislators. So we thank you for your time and support, of course. Glad, glad to. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, it's uh, we'll do a time check here. We do have one resolution to vote on, but we have an important report on coming up next on our next item here. Uh, related to some of our, our being prepared for some of these uh, federal potential resources. So, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, the next item on the discussion calendar, item number five, update on the four agency zero emission vehicle strategy and federal funding work. And I have Jaime Lemos on the line to start this presentation. Great. Thank you, Mark. Mr. Lemos. And as, as many of you know, Congressman Barra had uh, reached out with many of those uh, uh, about this issue. And I think we are leading the pack nationally, I, I, I feel. But, uh, Mr. Lemos. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll try to be brief, but also don't want to cut too much information out here. Um, and then I'm also going to have some, uh, some of our partners join us. So again, just for the record, I'm Jaime Lemos and uh, I'm the Transportation and Climate Change Division Manager here at the Sacramento District. And I'll be presenting today on the federal funding and the Sacramento Region Zero Emission Strategy. And as many of you know, you guys have been tracking and hearing a lot on the news on the federal funding and how much funding that is. 
And as mentioned today already, I'm gonna be joined by Rachel Hong from SMUD, Chris Flores from SACRT, Sam Shelton with SACOG. And we'll be sharing on how our four agencies have been working together and what the plan is for our region. Next slide, please. So first let's talk about the federal funding. That's what's been on the news. And I know that a lot of you are already tracking this. There's $18 billion in new federal funding, infra infrastructure funding for vehicles and infrastructure. This funding is over five years. And some of this funding is formula funding and some of this funding will be competitive. $5 billion will be plugged into the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Funding Formula. So this could be around 350 to $400 million for California. And this is based on a 2020, 2021 allocation. There's $5 billion for electric school buses and 5.6 billion for low NOx or no emission buses. In addition to this funding, the Biden administration is allocating over $9 billion to develop clean hydrogen capacity in the US. Next slide, please. The state is not falling behind. There's $10 billion in new state funds for ZEV vehicles and infrastructure. $6 billion for big ZEVs. And so the big ZEVs are what we know as heavy duty, like big rigs, tractors, trains, et cetera. 2.4 billion for passenger and light duty vehicles. And in addition, there's also the Volkswagen mitigation funds and the Carl Moyer program. So that makes another 535 million in addition to all of this. And we've already heard our strategies highlight our efforts with the Carl Moyer program. This program is critical as it targets criteria pollutants such as diesel PM and NOx and has the potential to do much more. The federal and state funding investment on infrastructure and zero emission mobility totals $18 billion. That's a lot of money. Next slide, please. And so we've been getting ready for this. The four agencies, SACRT, SMUD, SACOG, and us, we've been collaborating for over four years now. We've been creating support for each other, using each other's expertise in specific areas and leveraging resources and funding. We're ensuring that our projects are in alignment with the regional efforts. We're, making, we're working together to prioritize VMT reduction, air pollution, climate resiliency, zero emission transportation, and green jobs. Next slide, please. The four agencies came up with the Sacramento Area Zero Emission Vehicle Deployment Strategy. This strategy focuses on four regional funding priorities, zero emission goods movement, charging stations and ZEV mobility in under-resourced communities, zero emission transit and infrastructure, and community workforce development. Next slide, please. We're gonna dive a little bit into these priorities. So based on the West Coast, Clean Transit Corridor Initiative study by SMUD and many other utility providers in the state, five major zero emission plazas would be needed to support our region for ZEV goods movement. And so Sacramento sits on the intersection of I-5, 80, and the 99, which makes it ideal to focus on the heavy duty transportation sector. And so not only are the power utilities coordinating, we're also talking to our air district partners and our private sector partners on potential sites. But currently, we're working with Sac County and a private sector partner on this idea. So we'll be sharing a little bit more on this next month. We also have to consider the impacts of light duty sector, but also addressing zero emission mobility and grid solutions at the same time. The team agreed that a total of 52 e-mobility hubs can really make an impact in our region. And th these uh, hubs will be both uh, throughout the Sacramento region in rural and urban areas. These e-mobilities will be in partnership with community orgs and multifamily housing. So they will include amenities such like electric vehicle charging, car share, electric shuttles, potential for electric bikes and scooters, and battery storage. Next slide, please. In 2019, the California Air Resources passed the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. And since then, we've been working with our partner SACRT to transition their fleet to zero emission. The vehicle transition must also consider fueling infrastructure, which makes the transition more challenging and more expensive. And we'll hear a little bit more on this from Chris Flores from SACRT at the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. As the four agencies develop these priorities, we agreed that any of the funding that comes our way should always support our local economy and stimulate our local job market. 
in order to continue growing our green technology workforce, we also need to focus on increasing our community's opportunity in the sector. And so this aligns with Valley Vision's prosperity strategy and future mobility and green jobs. The California Mobility Center incorporates all of this. The CMC has already launched a workforce development program to recruit under-resourced community members towards high paying jobs that will, create, that will be created in this space. The CMC is also working with community-based organizations, junior colleges, vocational schools, and high schools to create a pipeline of workers to support all of these clean technologies. As a side note, the CMC will be celebrating their one year anniversary with a California Mobility Showcase. So please keep an eye out on your email. Uh, there'll be an invitation sent to you for this event. Next slide, please. So what do we do with all of this? And what do we do with the Sacramento Area Zero Emission Vehicle Deployment Strategy? Well, it's a framework to work from, but it also aligns the priorities for the four agencies. But this isn't enough. We've also hired Momentum, a Sacramento-based company that designs, develops, and deploys innovative campaigns. Momentum will develop the strategy document into a package that is easy to present and to discuss. We'll use this package to socialize a strategy with key legislators, stakeholders, partners, and of course, you, our board. So we've asked our partners to join us on this item so they could each share on the importance of our partnership and priorities. And so first we have the regional perspective. We have Sam Shelton from SACOG. Thank you, Jaime. SACOG is a proud partner of the Sacramento area zero vehicle, uh, zero emission vehicle deployment strategy. Uh, ZEVs are an important part of helping the region meet our GHG reduction target. We know we cannot get there by only reducing vehicle miles traveled, and we know we cannot meet this challenge on our own. The four agencies ZEV deployment strategy shows the federal and state agencies that we are committed to share our shared ZEV priorities and have already taken it, the initiative on implementing that strategy. Now for transit fleets, our region's transportation plan recognizes that SACOG does not have the funding structure to address the region's fleet conversion needs without securing the competitive funding. Now for freight, SACOG has sponsored a planning grant application to address not only this region's, but the broader mega region's medium and heavy duty freight charging needs along our major freight corridor routes. Now for mobility hubs, our Green Means Go program and Next Gen Transit study both show the need for infill opportunity areas and mobility hubs where people can make the EV choice, be that an EV bus, e-car share program, or an e-cargo bike. Uh, we recently supported SMUD's grant application for level two chargers at various low income multifamily housing across Sacramento County. Uh, the workforce development and under-resourced communities, uh, SICOG has recently acted on our racial equity statement that will help bring that lens to everything SICOG does, including our upcoming engage, empower, and implement program to help spur the best outreach activities to address the community's needs. And so SACOG is committed to supporting the ZEB deployment strategy and continuing our partnership with Air District. Thank you, Sam. And so next we'll have Chris Flores from SACRT. Yeah, thank you, Jaime. And thank you for the opportunity to comment on this item. I, I wanna thank their quality staff and Dr. Ayala for highlighting this important work. Um, SACRT is truly appreciative of the partnership and the collaboration across the four agencies. Um, we are in alignment moving toward the zero emission transportation sector, working in tandem as we pursue federal and state fu um, funding for our community. Our region is more competitive when we have a shared vision and partnerships to execute on them. And the four agency strategy is truly critical for SACRT moving forward. As Jaime mentioned, the California Air Resources Board requires that transit agencies um, transition their entire fleet to zero emission by 2040 through the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. After 2029, we must exclusively purchase zero emission vehicles. With the support um, from the other agencies, SACRT has developed a zero emission bus rollout plan, providing a roadmap for the transition. SACRT currently has 24 zero emission buses in our fleet, but with more than 500 small and big buses in total, um, the transition will require a robust partnership with the entire community be, to be successful. At the SACRT board meeting on Monday, we will be presenting an, our zero emission vehicle transition plan phase two work as we start to accelerate this transition. This will be an immense effort requiring coordination on all levels um, as our plans come into focus and we identify new facilities, perform utility and infrastructure enhancements, and transition our fleet. 
Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you, Chris. And finally, we have Rachel Hong from SMUD. And so Rachel has been our lead on this effort. Thank, thank you, Jaime. And, and really, it's, it's been a collaborative effort. So I uh, appreciate Jaime, Alberto, and the board for having uh, me join all of you today. As all of you know, SMUD's 2030 Zero Carbon Plan is working to achieve zero carbon emissions from our electricity by 2030. A key part of this plan is to decarbonize the transportation sector through electrification, where zero emissions from our electricity can translate into true zero emission vehicles and mobility. This is really important to SMUD as a community owned organization to ensure local emissions reduction benefits, as well as improved air quality for all of those that live in our region. But in addition to reducing the emissions, we believe that the increase in electric vehicles can actually serve as a significant contributor to integrate more renewable energy onto our grid as the numerous battery storage systems in the vehicles can contribute to capacity needs and help support reliability in the future as we transition away from fossil fuel based generation. The zero emission vehicle deployment strategy and the regional funding priorities developed by the four agencies are critical focus areas to help meet SMUD's ambitious carbon reduction goals and is aligned to our EV strategy as well as our agency's funding priorities as we seek grant funding for us and in partnership with all of you in the region. I can't begin to start saying how much at SMUD that we are appreciative of the collaboration and partnership between our four agencies. Uh, we value the power of the alignment between us not only in presenting our region as unified in our goals and approach and seeking these state and federal funding as these big dollars come available for zero emissions transportation, but, and, and Rafe is always the good one about reminding us all of this whenever we meet on a monthly basis, but simply in the power of working together. As we leverage each other's resources, as we concentrate our efforts on these unified priorities to advance improved air quality, access to clean mobility and investment in the prosperity of our region. Thanks. Thank you, Rachel. I want to thank all of our partners for joining us today, and now we'll open it up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, very much. Let me uh, bring this back to the board. This is just a presentation to update you on where we are on the four agency strategy. Many of you might see this presentation on other boards if you sit on SACOG or the RRT. Uh, we don't have any SMUD board members here, but uh, this is a, a great multi-agency partnership. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, I just wanted to uh, uh, you know, thank everyone again. I, I see the biggest gain here on the goods movement, you know, the, the fact that we can look at manufacturing and workforce training and building and exporting goods here, just like we're exporting trains uh, out of Sacramento County in the Sacramento region here. I do see where this is a, a huge economic win for us of uh, the fact that our multi-agencies are looking at solutions for us to meet our air quality needs, but more importantly, um, if we can get into the uh, manufacturing and production sector for the rest of the state, you know, we, uh, this, is, this is a huge benefit for, our, for all of our uh, biz local businesses and workers who are looking for employment. So with that, uh, thank you very much, Jaime and everyone. And let's, uh, Madam Clerk, I see no hands raised. Is there any members of the public signed up to speak on this, Madam Clerk? No, not at this time. Seeing none, uh, we're going to go on to our last item here. And uh, Madam Clerk, I want to make sure we have a quorum because uh, we do have to vote on this. If you don't mind checking while we uh, start the presentation, I, I, I think a board member Kennedy needed to step off briefly. Okay. I just did a quick scan and we still have quorum. Very good. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item. The next item on the discussion calendar, the last item, item number six. Agreements with the Sacramento Air District Air, Air District Employee Association, unrepresented pres personnel resolution and classification plan update. And I have Alberto IL on the line to start this presentation for us. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. If you can um, pull up the slides. Um, I'm gonna introduce the, uh, the item for the board. I just wanna make a couple of observations and, and a few remarks about the process. And then I'm gonna have my colleague uh, Pat Smith uh, walk you through some of the key points, uh, some of the highlights as a part of the negotiation. Next slide, please. Next slide. I, I, I wanted to share a few thoughts in terms of my experience, in particular leading the uh, the negotiating team on, on behalf of the agency. And, and, and really, you know, just maybe share with you um, some rather obvious points, but I think it's worth uh, you know, putting on the table for your consideration. And that is 
um, as any agency, we're only as good as our people. Uh, we're only as good at the staff that we can that we can attract, that we can retain, that we can support, uh, that we can encourage, and um, um, you know that that was that was a principle that was that was front and center as we enter uh, in, into negotiations. Um, obviously, um, any type of negotiation is 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 not necessarily a straight you know, walk in the park. Uh, but I'm very proud of the fact that um, the employee uh, union uh, took a very constructive approach uh, to the process. And I, and I want to acknowledge that. Um, the, the things that, that we want for our agency are very simple. You know, we want to be the best employ employer that we can. We want people to be motivated. We want people to be happy. And we're very fortunate that we have a, 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 a wonderful staff of, of dedicated professionals. So then the, the challenge for us is how do we make sure that we support and retain them? Um, and clearly the pandemic didn't help any of that. Uh, the pandemic presented us with additional challenges that we wanted to be uh, very cognizant of. So one of the things that, that, that we start off saying uh, in the negotiating process is, I want an agency, we want an agency that can be as general, generous as possible. Clearly, uh, you've heard us uh, speak many times of some of the fiscal challenges that we do have. Uh, they will continue to, to be pervasive and we're gonna you know, talk to you in the future as we bring you our budget. But at the same time, we didn't wanna just simply assume that we couldn't afford anything in terms of improving the contract with the employee union. So we set out um, from that perspective and luckily we did identify uh, some few areas that were pretty, um, pretty obvious the right thing to do. It is going to come with a very modest impact on the budget, uh, but again, at the end of the at the end of the day, I'm very pleased because we were able to have a process that was that was constructive, that was respectful, that was uh, more than anything keeping in mind the mutual interest of our agency, the things that we do, and obviously uh, the staff that that make up our our air district family. So I just wanted to say share those high level perspectives with you before you hear some of the detail that is going to go into the new contract. So uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Pat. All right, thank you, Alberto. Good morning, Chair Guerra, members of the board. Um, as Alberto said, my name is Pat Smith. I'm the program manager for the Administrative Services Division. And today I'd like to make a brief presentation on the recent labor negotiations um, to cover proposed changes to the labor agreements for represented employees, as well as proposed changes to the resolution that we have in place for unrepresented employees. And then finally, uh, some proposed changes to the district's classification plan. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will ask the board to take action to adopt a resolution authorizing the, the execution of new labor agreements for represented employees, to adopt an updated resolution for unrepresented employees, and to pass a motion to approve uh, changes to the district's classification plan. So uh, next slide, please. So the current labor agreements, um, with SADIA, which is the Employee Association, and the rep resolution for unrepresented employees expire at the end of June. So that's why we're in the middle of this process now. Um, as Alberto shared, it was, it was a pretty good process. We began by having a couple of meetings. Um, management, the team had five representatives as, and SADIA put forth a team of, of five. So altogether, 10 of us, um, didn't literally sit in a room, we were on Zoom, but um, we started the process off by establishing some agreed upon ground rules and, and, and uh, agreed primarily to be respectful and, and cordial and, and move forward. And I think that's how things unfolded. Um, so we had a couple meetings, initial meetings, um, management met with the budget and personnel committee in November and we were instructed to proceed with um, negotiations with Sadia and to come back to the full board um, with a proposal for new agreements, which is why we're here today. Um, Sadia put the, um, put the agreements to a vote. So they have three bargaining units and each of the bargaining units voted in favor of the proposed agreements and as I said, so here we are today with these new agreements. Next slide, please. So 
So the labor agreements for represented employees, um, we're proposing a five-year term, which is the same as the agreements that are going to expire in June. So no change there. Uh, the cost of living adjustment range will remain with a minimum of 2% and the maximum of 4%. And that's been in place for many, many years. Um, some of the things that we're pro proposing to change, one is the employees currently contribute to, health, to a health flexible spending account. And in the agreements, there was a cap of $2,550. And what we'd like to do is change that to not have a cap in the agreement, but just set the cap at whatever the IRS limit is for the particular plan year. On the dental, we have a pretty good dental plan, um, but we worked with our broker and came up with what we're calling an enhanced dental plan. So it would be a, a voluntary plan and, and employees would essentially be able to buy up and get an enhanced benefit, which is an increased expenditure limit for the year. And the incremental cost, if, if, some, if an employee elects the enhanced plan would be borne by the employee. So they would pay, pay the premium difference for that. The uh, vision plan, we're proposing to that the district cover the employee only portion of the premiums for the vision plan and that the employee continue to pay for their enrolled dependents. Next slide, please. A few more things. Um, 457 plan, so that's the deferred compensation plan. The district currently has a biweekly match of $30. We're proposing to increase that to 35. We are proposing to add bilingual pay. So this is a new item and we would compensate employees uh, for the use of their transactions, translation skills, excuse me. And then finally, holiday pay, we changed the language there to ensure that overtime is paid for work on holidays, whether it's an observed holiday or an actual holiday, say, that falls on a weekend. So overall cost estimates for these changes, 18000 to about $36,000. Um, next slide, please. So for the unrepresented um, employees, which that is includes the four division managers, and then it includes five classifications that are, are management or supervisory classifications that are confidential and are not represented by SADIA. Uh, the term of that agreement would also be five years. Uh, the expiring agreement was for five years and, and the term coincides with the uh, agreements with the Employees Association. So, and then historically, the agreements for the represented employees, the benefits that are provided therein are also um, provided to the unrepresented employees. The unrepresented employees essentially receive those benefits as well as some additional benefits um, established in the unrepresented personnel resolution. The real change here is that the confidential supervisory group would transition from being overtime eligible to being treated as exempt, so no longer overtime eligible, but would be eligible uh, to cash out a certain amount of vacation hours and have some administrative time off. Next slide, please. And then finally, the classification plans. So the class district classification plan, essentially, it's all the job classifications for authorized positions, you know, collected in, in, in one document, if you will. And um, of course, when we do negotiations, we look at the class plan to see if there are anything through negotiations results in a necessary change to the class plan. So we've made any changes there for that reason. We've also done some general housekeeping with the document, cleaning some things up and just making it a better document. Those particular details are, are outlined in the, in the board report, but the most notable change in the document is that we have created a separate job description for the administrative services program manager, which is my position. And the real reason for that is, is the role, the duties and responsibilities of my position as a program manager are pretty significantly different than program managers in the other areas of the organization. So um, really for me to be properly held accountable, we need a job description that reflects what I'm expected to do. So that's the main change there. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, I'll stop for questions at this point in time, and then um, we've got some actions that we would like to recommend, but are there any questions? Let me bring this back to the board here. I don't see any hand raised at the moment. Um, and um, let's see, and I, um, yep, no questions here at the moment, uh, Mr. Smith. Okay, thank you. Um, so what we would propose, we would like the board to take the following option, actions. One is to adopt two resolutions. One is to authorize the execution of new labor agreements with Sadia. The other is to approve the updated personnel, unrepresented personnel resolution. And then the final action would be to pass a motion approving the updated district classification plan. Very good. Madam Clerk, uh, do we have any members on the public signed up to speak on this item? No, we do not. Okay, let me bring it back to the board, Board Member Frost. Thank you, Chair Gear. I, I just have a question regarding the vacation time. In the past, I've worked on a board where um, people had the ability to um, cash out on their vacation time and and actually build, you know, carry over over time. And at one point, it, it kind of got us into a financial problem where, because where we had some employees that had never taken vacation time and we owed them tens of thousands of dollars. And so I wondered if you could please clarify um, carry carry over. I, I'm not quite sure. And this this um, change in, in the vacation time. I know, you know, we, we always hope people are going to take vacations and some of us aren't very good at that. We would rather just have the money collecting so we know it's there in a pinch and we can use it for, can they use it for sick leave? So I just wondered if you could um, explain how that's going to work. I'm concerned about us putting ourselves in a position of um, having some, some debt that's building um, that will hit us all at once. Um, Board member for us. Let me bring this over to uh, Mr. Smith and Dr. Ayala. Mr. Smith. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So we have a we have an existing cap on vacation. So employees at some point they need to take their vacation or they they stop accruing and it's 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 it's, it's an incentive having the caps an incentive for them to take time off. So uh, the cap's pretty low and and so we don't foresee, you know, we wouldn't face some kind of an astronomical payout of, if everybody cashed out all their vacation. And, and the, the vacation cash out portion of it, which, which we talked about for the unrepresented employees, that's been available to division managers for quite some time. And it would be a newly added thing for, and it's a tiered structure. So for example, vacation uh, division managers can cash out up to 40 hours per year of vacation confidential managers, I think it's 32, and then confidential supervisors, it's 24 that they could cash out in a given fiscal year. But um, does that answer your questions, Director Frost? Uh, yeah, so so they can't accrue it year over year over time. And so that's good. It, it, it seems like a, a safety, you know, a little bit of a safety. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Board Member Frost. Let me bring this over to uh, Board. I'm, a th I'm assuming it's Board Member Terry. This is Donald's iPhone. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I need to change my name when I signed into it. Uh, I'm having some connectivity issues. Um, I guess a couple of things there. I, as far as I understand, and I've dealt with this at a couple of different employers, in California, you can't lose hours year over year if you, like, if you don't take it and whatever employer has a policy of not allowing you to accrue over X. That, that's really not legal in California. But I think more importantly, to, to your point, really these kinds of problems are a management issue that people aren't taking vacation and vacation isn't meant to be banked, to be paid out when you leave or something like that. And it, it really is something that Dr. Ayala, you and, and your team really just need to focus on making sure that, you know, people that accrue vacation take vacation and vacation is meant to be used. It's not meant to be banked. Um, and so, you know, I think that's even something maybe that, um, for the budget personnel committee, maybe that's something that we take a look at every six months or a year and just make sure that we're not seeing really large accruals. Um, but anywhere that I've seen this become a problem, it's because you have a bunch of people that, yeah, they're just banking their, their vacation, one, because they may be quitting soon or because their manager really isn't holding them accountable to actually leave work and take some vacation. 
but it is it is a good thing to to note, and I think it's something that going forward the board and and Dr. Ayala should you know maybe have a regular update just to make sure that it's it's not becoming a problem. Um, Chair Gera, yes, uh, um, um, Jamil, uh -huh. here. Hi, thank you. This I'll... is Jamil Mooms. Uh, is it okay if I comment? I just wanted to add one remark. Yes. Here, get it? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also add that for the vacation time that um, employees are, managers are allowed to cash out, they have to take the equivalent of that vacation time. So they can't just um, cash out. And, it's, and as Pat said, it's very limited. It's very nominal in terms of what's cashed out. And we in HR, um, Pat oversees that, we run reports and we share that with managers on a frequent basis to ensure that people are taking their time. And we talk to managers, if people are starting to accrue, so if anybody's getting within a certain range, we, we address that and we make sure that they um, have a plan. They have to have a plan from their employees of, of what they're planning to do with their vacation and how they're gonna manage that. So we are um, very conscientious of that. We want our folks to take the time off and, uh, and really make sure they rejuvenate and recuperate. And so it's something we closely monitor. So I just did want to add that, that comment. Thank you. Can I just say too, Jamil, that's the best freaking answer I've ever heard of the, about this issue for any organization I've ever dealt with. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Ms. Moons. Uh, let me bring this over to board member Harris. here. Actually, Jamil just addressed uh, everything about the subject, I think. It is very important for people to take their vacation. And the fact that this organization moves in that direction is just another indication of how well this organization is run. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Jamil. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Daniels, I heard you uh, go off mute there. No, I'm just, uh, I think everything got answered. So yeah, very nice. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I will say, uh, seeing no more questions from the board here, I, the only thing I will say this last couple of years and, you know, the 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 holiday uh, pay issue is a critical one because our staff, I, I, I think, is at a point where they've, they've been overworked, but like many of our departments have. And uh, even before the pandemic, if we all recall, um, in an effort to try to address the structural deficits that we saw coming, uh, we didn't fully hire so that we can be, be able to manage and get on track. Um, then the pandemic hit and our staff has maintained the quality of this organization and moving forward. And so we want this, I, I believe this, con, this, uh, this uh, negotiated uh, position here identifies all of that. We wanna stay competitive and make people feel that this is a good organization to work in. They believe in the mission, they believe in the organization uh, and, that, uh, uh, and that also, uh, you know, I think the, the management has been great here in this effort. So uh, all, all to say, I think we've gotten to a very good point where we're at. And uh, I would hope that uh, we have a, a member of the board wishing to move this uh, uh, resolution and to approve uh, the negotiated uh, labor agreement. Chair, I'll, I'll move, move the item, move Terry. Resolutions. It's been moved by board member Harris, seconded by board member Terry. Any further discussion from the board? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Director Aquino? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Desmond? Director Frost? Aye. Chair Guetta? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Kennedy? Director Lalowy? Aye. Director Natoli? Director Papinel? Aye. Director Serna? Uh, Director Singh Allen? Aye. Director Terry? Aye. Director Vang? Yes. This item passes. Thank you very much. And I do want to take this time to, to thank all of our staff. This organization doesn't happen and doesn't execute its goals. It's very strict federal and state mandates without all of the, the hard work from the staff. So I, I do want to thank you. And, and at the end of the day, this is a public health agency. So the outcomes of our work is the public health of our constituents. So thank you for all your work. Uh, Madam, Madam Clerk, uh, next, I think that's the balance of our action items today. Madam Clerk, next item. That is, that is correct. The next item would be public comment. Are there any members of the public signed up to speak to discuss items not on the agenda? No, not right now. Okay, let's put it on, bring it back here. Uh, board items, comments, and AV1234 reports from the board. 
I see no hand raised from the board. Oh, I see uh, Director Aquino. Yes. Yeah, I think I just want to make some, an observation uh, from the presentation earlier about uh, the legislative update. Um, the one uh, or the, the two legislators who were not mentioned are those two who represent Folsom, Assemblyman Kevin Kiley and Senator Brian Daly. Um, and I fully realize that they are on um, a different side of the aisle from <laughs> the rest of your uh, representatives. Um, and, uh, you know, they may not ultimately support some of this legislation, but clean air should not be a partisan issue. And I just want to make sure that when the air district or, or our legislative advocates or representatives are reaching out to um, legislators that they don't forget those uh, who represent Folsom. Very, very well said. And, uh, and, and yes, and they actually have been involved in our regional discussions with the Sacramento uh, SACOG region. I will make sure that that is also said directly. Director Ayala, can you make sure that that is explicitly said? Absolutely. Uh, the point is very well taken, Director Aquino. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, interestingly, next year, uh, those lines are all going to be different. So <laughs> uh, we'll have to readjust uh, how, how that representation works as well. So uh, thank you, Director Aquino. Any other member comments from the board? Seeing none. Uh, well then, thank you, uh, members of the board, for your work and staff. Uh, again, uh, we are adjourned uh, at 10, 18 a.m. Everyone have a great day and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank you.